January 9th, 2022. Midnight in Pyongyang. The city sleeps. Then, everything goes dark. North Korea's entire internet vanishes. Government websites collapse one by one, like dominoes falling in silence. Panic spreads through the regime's inner circle. Was it the Americans? The South Koreans? A cyber retaliation for Kim Jong-un's missile tests? Experts scramble for answers, but none are even close. Because the truth isn't a state operation or a secret army behind firewalls. It's one man, in pajamas, alone in a quiet room. No team, no backup, just a keyboard, a grudge, and a few lines of code that brought a nation off line. One year earlier, January 2021, in a dim room, an American cybersecurity researcher scrolls through long columns of code, the monitor painting his face in pale light. He answers to a single name online, P4X Quiet, discipline, always hunting the next vulnerability. One night, a colleague sends a new testing tool. Cautious, he loads it inside a locked virtual machine and watches. For a while, nothing happens, just the low hum of the computer and the glow of the display. Within 24 hours, a major tech firm posts an alert. Security researchers are being targeted with weaponized files, tools that look harmless but contain traps. P4X reopens the file. His chest tightens. Buried inside the code is a back door, a hidden doorway left deliberately for intruders. Traces point to North Korean operators. Overnight, his work shifts definition. From researcher to target, he reports the incident. An FBI agent takes a statement. Then the silence sets in. No follow-up, no protection, no public pushback. That silence breeds a kind of cold anger. Resentment settles and then hardens into resolve. If no one at home will answer for the intrusion, perhaps he must. He studies the target, sketches maps, catalogs weak servers, and unpatched services. What he finds is brittle, a tiny, fragile slice of the global internet propped up by old software and sloppy configurations. By late 2021, his choice is made. He stops waiting to be defended. He starts preparing to strike. Tools are written, scripts are staged on rented servers, and precautions are taken to hide his trail. Alone, he asks the impossible question, can a single determined operator push an entire country offline and remain unseen? P4X is about to find out. He waits a beat, breath steady, then hits enter. Packets begin to flow from rented servers and his laptop, a cold, invisible current slipping across the ocean. At first, the screen looks unchanged. A logs scroll, counters climb, the same quiet rhythm of machines. Then, almost imperceptibly, answers start to fade. One host stops responding. Another hangs. Pages that once loaded instantly begin to stall, then vanish. He watches the list shrink, a slow, terrible scoreboard of collapse. Error boxes pile up, timers run out. Lights on distant routers dim in data he can't see but can feel through the numbers outside his room the world carries on unaware inside the small slice of north korea's network confusion turns fast to panic email queues jam external portals time out state sites that normally display propaganda return only blank screens he checks independent uptime monitors and watches the graphs spike into red an analyst tweets a baffled note forums flare with questions and screenshots p4x allows himself a thin private smile. It is working. No one knows it is him. He does not celebrate. He keeps moving. The scripts pivot to the next cluster, breathless and precise, like a crew moving along a line of dominoes. He adjusts timing, shifts routes, watches for signs that anyone is tracing the traffic back to him. Success feels fragile, like holding a glass sculpture at the edge of a storm. For a few hours, he has proven a terrible thing. Even a regime that wraps itself in secrecy can be exposed undone by code and patience. Dawn arrives and the blackout remains. Triumph and unease sit together. He has made his point. He has forced the regime to feel a vulnerability it has spent decades hiding, but the quiet afterward is heavy. Questions are already forming. How long before investigators notice patterns? How long before someone decides to retaliate? He closes his laptop for a moment, breathing the same air as always, and knows the night's work was only the beginning night. In a quiet Miami home, monitors glow. Packets pour out from rented servers and his laptop, crossing oceans toward a tiny, fragile network on the other side of the world. At first, it feels almost ordinary. Just scripts running, logs scrolling, the steady hum of machines. He drags a movie onto the TV and pretends to relax, snacking between checks. Each few minutes, he walks back to the desk, eyes on the counters. Each time he looks, the list of live hosts shrinks a little more. Then the failures start to stack. A booking site times out. The regime 
regime's main portal goes silent. State media pages refuse to load. From outside, visitors see error messages and blank screens. Inside the country, officials discover external email and web tools are unreachable. He watches independent uptime feeds flip to red. Charts spike. An analyst posts bewildered updates. Forums fill with screenshots and guesses. P4X allows a small private smile. It is working. No one knows it is him. He does not relax. He keeps pushing. His scripts hammer a host until it collapses, then move to the next cluster. Routers slow. Connections choke. The few gateways that link the hermit state to the world groan under traffic. He tunes packet timing, masks headers, shifts routes, always trying to hide pattern and origin. It is technical work, patient work, surgical and relentless. Every success feels both exhilarating and fragile. By dawn, most public-facing sites are down. A nation's online facade has been reduced to error pages and timeouts. Triumph and unease sit together inside him. He has proven a point. Secrecy and control are not invulnerable to code, but the victory is only the opening move. The world will notice. Investigations will follow. Authorities will trace signals. The regime may try to retaliate. He breathes, checks his logs one last time, records timestamps, wipes a few traces, and closes his laptop. The night is over, but the war is just beginning. Morning breaks and confusion follows. Who pulled the plug on North Korea's internet? Across analyst chats and intelligence channels, the question spreads fast. An entire country offline doesn't happen by accident. Theories spring up everywhere. Was it a covert strike? Some point to US Cyber Command. Others whisper about South Korea. A few suggest a state-backed hacker unit flexing muscle. The timing seems deliberate days after North Korea's latest missile tests. To many, the outage looks like a quiet rebuke. Pyongyang stays silent, and that silence becomes part of the story. Inside North Korea, almost no one notices. Only a tiny elite touches the global web. The blackout hits the regime's outward-facing systems, propaganda portals, government servers, foreign email channels. For ordinary citizens, life goes on. For the leadership, it's slow humiliation. A government obsessed with control suddenly looks exposed. Outside, watchers can't look away. Tech forums light up with charts and speculation. Journalists push theories. Social media fills with outage graphs. Sites blink back online for a moment, then vanish again. The pattern looks deliberate, like someone flipping a switch to prove a point. No government claims responsibility. No hacker collective steps forward. The mystery deepens, and the noise grows. Behind that noise, in a quiet Miami home, P4X reads the headlines. He scrolls through threads naming entire nations, and smiles. None are right. The blackout they're dissecting began in a spare room, with one person in a t-shirt and pajamas. That anonymity is his shield. As long as no one connects the dots, he's safe. The calm brings new words. How long can a single operator stay ahead? What if North Korea traces the traffic? What if an intelligence agency notices unusual patterns? For now, he's winning. He embarrassed a nuclear state with nothing but code. In his mind, it wasn't an attack on civilians. It was a strike against propaganda, the digital version of tearing down a dictator's posters. But success changes him. The blackout proved his skill, but it also felt small. Outages make noise, but secrets make impact. The idea of digging deeper, breaching servers, Pulling data, exposing the regime takes hold. If outages embarrass, leaks humiliate. That thought becomes obsession. Quietly, he tests the next step. On the dark web, he posts a manifesto and challenge called The Funk Project. It's part statement, part invitation. One person shut them down. Imagine what a small group could do. Reactions split. Some call him bold, others reckless. Security professionals warn he could disrupt ongoing intelligence operations. A loud vigilante could ruin years of work. Legal experts remind him that hacking is illegal. No exceptions. He knows prison is possible. Pyongyang could retaliate, but he's driven by anger and a sense of unfinished justice. North Korean hackers targeted researchers like him before, and no one followed up. So he keeps going, hoping his defiance will push his own government to act. When asked where it ends, he jokes about regime change, then shrugs. He isn't toppling governments. He's proving they aren't untouchable. No knock on the door, no retaliation, just quiet. And the thrill of having pulled off the impossible. The outage fades from headlines, but P4X keeps watching logs, tweaking code, ready to strike again. A ghost in his own story. But a darker question looms. What happens when others follow? When cyber revenge becomes cyber profit, stolen data, hijacked accounts, identity dumps, the line between justice and exploitation is razor thin. The blackout showed a nation's digital fragility. It also hinted at a future where hacking isn't about politics, but profit.